deal with the um, question of sin, original sin, and uh, other related topics. It's called How to Teach This Without Being Crucified. Uh, that's another one of these subjects that if you, if you handle the way some of us have already handled it, nobody likes you and not calculated to win Jews and influence Greeks. So I want to again give you this morning a way in which to teach the subject of original sin that will absolutely minimize any problems that you might run into normally in doing it. I've tried to very carefully analyze over the last few years why it is that people freak out when you teach this, why it is that I freaked out when I first heard it. And uh, I think it usually comes because people think there is only one historical position concerning man's sin. The reason why this has come about is simple. The people who write the most, who talk the most, usually are connected in this area. Most of the theology books that have written have been written in an Augustinian tradition. And therefore, the entire sweep of history and what people thought at different times in history has been ignored and just simply is not known by a vast number of people to whom you speak. And those who do know the position uh, usually come through uh, some kind of Bible college or semin seminary, and especially those who have been through seminary. I don't know of any seminaries in this nation, for instance, that would strongly emphasize um, a non-Augustinian position. Almost all the seminaries that have been set up uh, have been orientated around Augustinian thought. So here is the first thing we do if we're going to deal with the subject of sin. The first thing you do is you tell the people of the two historical extremes. And on one side you put Augustine so that everybody knows his position is an extreme. And I usually tell people there are two historical extreme views on this subject. One is Augustine's and then on the other side, you put this character by the name of Pelagius. So the debate concerning, I don't use the subject original sin, but the, how did sin get into our race and how is it carried on? Um, use words something like that, which is a bit more accurate. Um, really began with these two men. And then you can give the date, if you like, of Augustine. Uh, when he lived, I think I gave it to you last night. He was born in 354 AD. This is nearly at least three and a half he was born that. So the debate probably got started almost 400 years after the death of Christ and almost 400 years after the early church teaching and stuff like that. Uh, Augustine was not converted until 384. Um, he was a dude quite heavy into study, but he lived a kind of life that would make Hugh Hefner look like a Sunday school kid. Um, couldn't get married, so he took about five mistresses and stuff like that. But uh, while he was waiting to be married, um, and the thing that, that really changed his life is that he picked up, uh, one time he seemed to hear a voice saying to him, take up and read, when he had a Bible lying there. And he picked it up and he read these words, not in rioting and drunkenness and stuff, but put ye on the Lord Jesus Christ and make not provision for the flesh to fulfill the lust thereof. So that scripture changed his life. He became a Christian. He was baptized by Ambrose, one of the early church leaders, 387 A.D. And then in 391 A.D. he was ordained a priest. Uh, 
And then this was when he had been five years a Christian. He'd been saved five years. In 396, five years later, he was made Bishop of Hippo, which became his... I don't know why he's made Bishop of Hippo. Wasn't that fat. Three eight four, he was converted, and um, so he had been then a Christian by that time for ten years. So he, as a ten-year-old Christian, was made in charge of the whole of North Africa, bishop. And then he began to write. Three hundred ninety-seven. One year later, he began his writings. The Confessions of Augustine they were written as an 11-year-old Christian. This is a little bit better than Calvin, who wrote his institute three years after he became a Christian. Five years meant that he had been saved five years when he was ordained a priest. Yeah, 391, he'd been saved. And then five years later, he was made uh, a bishop. He died 430 A.D. What was that? He was converted in 384. And five years later, he was made a priest. No, wait a minute. What am I talking about? That's not. He was baptized by Ambrose in 387. That's right. And in 391, he was ordained a priest. Now, he died 430 A.D. Died 430 A.D. Had quite a lot of books. He wrote widely, preached a great deal. Pelagius, on the other hand, was not a well-known person. Augustine was well-known. Pelagius was not. Pelagius... um, was a sort of a... He was a, a monk in one side and wrote some, some things. Uh, when Augustine began to write and started getting some new ideas about what he thought things should be like, Pelagius wrote some opposite things which really hardened the battle. Now, Bethany Fellowship has in their library files a translation of the original debate between Augustine and Pelagius, translated from, from, originally it was in Latin, translated into German, and then translated into English. It's a very interesting thing, because you see Augustine tightening up his position in reaction to what Pelagius said. And so Augustine began fairly loosely, and then when Pelagius counteracted what he said, he really tightened up his position, then went digging around trying to find scriptures to... He had already committed himself publicly, this is what I believe, and from that point on he hardened into an extreme position. So now what I do at this point is I I define the two issues for the people, and I'll give you this. Um, Wedge has a copy of this. uh, this. But uh, we're going to state for you now the two historical uh, Augustine, we're going to let Augustine define Pelagianism for you and then we're going to give Augustine's view in their own words so we can see here is what Augustine called the works view the law being given this is a, a quote from Augustine now the will is of its own strength sufficient to fulfill that law. Though not assisted by any grace (laughs) 
imparted by the Holy Spirit in addition to instruction in that law. And that's a quote from Augustine on the Pelagian view. It's a fairly accurate summary of the Pelagian view. Now, let me explain this for you. Augustine is saying this. The Pelagians teach that man can simply on his own will without any divine help or any divine strength do everything that he is supposed to do. In other words, he does not need God's help at all. That's the Pelagian view. That man himself, on himself, and we could use Schaeffer's term, autonomously, can do anything at all that he's supposed to do. He does not need help from God. He does not need God at all to help him in any of these things. He can do it himself. Gordon Olson, in drawing the Pelagian view, would draw a line like that, a flat line, and say, this, uh, the ground is absolutely flat. You can do anything you want. There are no problems. There are no handicaps. There are no biases. There are no bents to overcome. Everything is beautiful in its own way. You can do it. All you have to do is do it. Yes, yes. This is an accurate summary of the Pelagian view. It is not a misquote. This is a, a, a fairly good statement of the Pelagian view. Um, I'm just giving it from Augustine so that people, those of you who are dealing with Augustinian scholars will not say, well, that is not... That is not uh, really what the Pelagians teach. They taught something else, blah, blah, blah. This is a statement from Augustine on what Pelagius taught. So if you're dealing with people who are Augustinian, it's good to quote the patron saint. And another, another side thing also by Augustine, I, I'll just put it out to the side, but you can put it underneath, is this. The grace of God, he says, bestowed is bestowed, I'll just put, is given in proportion to our deserts. And that's another quote from Augustine. The grace of God is proportion, is bestowed or given in proportion to our deserts. In other words, as we deserve it, God gives us grace. Yes. Yeah, that's a statement by Augustine, but that's not Augustine's thought. That's a statement by Augustine on Pelagius. Yes, it is. That's an accurate statement of Pelagianism in its day. In other words, you earn by your, what you're doing, by various things, you earn an increasing amount of grace from God. By doing a certain number of things, then you'll get a certain more... Uh, you know, God will be more inclined to help you if you're nicer. That's the, the idea behind it. Now, both of these are from Augustine himself, and they are fairly accurate summaries of Pelagianism in his day. Now we will give you Augustine's view, and it's important to see that this also is an extreme. These two, I tell people when I'm sharing with this, these two represent two opposite poles that the whole of church history has fought over in the last 1,500 years. The issue has never been nailed down and anybody has ever said we are absolutely right and everybody else is absolutely wrong. And if they have, they've been idiots. So there's been a real uh, argument about this. It's never been absolutely clear, do you see, in... in uh, and the arguments that have taken place since Augustine, where it only was clear was before Augustine, in early church history, and we're going to give you that in a second. Here's Augustine's view now. We'll call this the irresistible gift of faith. Now, here was Augustine's unique thought. It was unique with him, but it later became the dominant thought in the Latin church that faith was an irresistible gift that 
given by God to a few people whom he had selected on some basis known only to himself. God could have given it to others if he had so chosen because it is rejected by no hard heart. In other words, it's an irresistible gift of faith when it comes. No, no matter how hard your heart is, you would accept it if God gave it to you. But he did not. Without it, no man could perform any good, whether in thought, will, affection, or action. Without it, no man could perform any good. Whether in thought, affection, will, or action. That was Augustine's view. In other words, faith is something that God gives to some people that makes it possible for them to perform good, to do good acts, to think good thoughts, to feel good feelings, to make good choices, without which a man cannot possibly have. And then God picks out on his own, some basis known only to himself, that I will give this power of doing these things to these people. The others I will not. Now, if he gave it to anybody else, they too also would be able to do it. But he didn't choose to do that. Yes, Dave. That is a summary. Augustine's actual quotes on this is, you know, vast amount. Most of what he said was on that. I'm just boiling them all down, condensing it down in this thing. All right, so there's your two historical views. Now, at this point, I do not give them the early church's view, the view before Augustine. I just give them those two opposite poles and then do this. Underneath these two names, I put another two names. John Calvin, we'll just put Calvin, knowing it's not Calvin Holsinger. And then on this side, we put not here, but here, Jacob Arminius. So between J.C. and J.A., there's a big controversy down the line. Now, Calvin was a student of Augustine. And Augustine wrote a lot, so he had quite a lot to be a student of. And Calvin was the one who carried on the tradition. Luther also, Martin Luther, was also a student of Augustine. But Calvin and Luther differed in, two key, in one really main key area. Calvin's basic thrust was the sovereignty of God. The fact that God ruled everything. And, you know, John Calvin was a very heavy, God is a ruler, of, he rules, your, you know, rules this, rules that. It was really, John Calvin was like a fairly fatalistic kingdom of God preacher, which is all right in one way, except for the determinism of it. Martin Luther, on the other hand, was more interested in people getting saved. So his strong stress was justification by faith. But both of them were Augustinian. Both of them took as their basic study manual Augustine's Confessions and later books and used those as a base to study from. So when we are talking about the debate, we are not really talking about Pelagius and Augustine so much as the people who came after them and began to apply. Though these guys are the original beginners of the debate. Now Arminius... Jacob Arminius was not a Pelagian. He had a slightly different view. And his view was that, uh, though he had some of the same base as Augustine, he believed that man did need help from God in order to make it. So that's why I tell the people, we've got to move Arminius back a little bit. Move him more towards this side. Because he was not exactly a flat person. 
and here's Augustine, Augustine straight up and down. But because this became so popular, this side still remained exactly the way it is. Arminius moved this way, this side stayed where it was. There was nobody here that came out in church history that moved to a more moderate in-between position too. So we have Augustine, uh, we have on this side Arminius moving over towards the middle, but this side staying exactly where it is. And so the new, two new poles were no longer Pelagianism, but Armenianism and Calvinism. And Calvinism is absolutely straight all the way down, the same as Augustine. Arminius is not the same as Pelagius. He moved more towards the center. And it is from these two men that most of the historical debate takes place. When you have arguments today between, well, I'm a Calvinist, well, I'm an Armenian, blah, blah, you know, this stuff. Now, this is what you do next. And to do this, you're going to have to do a bit of your own study, but we'll just do it here. I asked the people, would you call out for me the names of some famous Christians you know? And we'll try, if I know um, anything about their backgrounds, I'll try to place them in one or other of these positions on the chart, more to one side or more to the other side. So I just asked the people, give me the names of some famous Christians. I'm going to ask you that. Give me the names of some famous Christians of the past. People, Billy Graham. Uh, say Billy for a second. I'll show you where he is. D.L. Moody. D.L. Moody was here. Just leaning that way. Well, give you Lauren Cunningham, Charles Finney, Gordon Olson, Winky Prattney, and all the other. They're not famous Christians yet. <laughs> I'm the most internationally unknown evangelist in the world. John Wesley, very interesting. John Wesley began here and then moved all the way over here. Francis Schaeffer, this side, interesting. Schaeffer is officially a Reformation theologian, which means it would put him in the stream of Calvin. But practically, Schaeffer can't live there, so he moves over here, practically. Watch my knee, this side. Billy Sunday, this side. Slight lean this way. Smith Wigglesworth, this side. All right, Tori, here. Slight lean that way. A.W. Tozer, um, this side, with a slight lean that way. A.B. Simpson. Simpson, I would put more over this side, more in the tradition of Spurgeon. Spurgeon was this way and flashed practically over here a lot. Early Pentecostals, this side. The Pentecostal stream came from this side and not from that side. Important that you know that. Early Pentecostal stream did not come from this side at all. Come from this side. Yeah, I think so. I think the stream started to shift back when, uh, when people wanted more scholarship and went to uh, seminaries for better training of the people and then picked up this side and begin to inject it in again. I think you're actually seeing that trend now. For the first time, the Assemblies of God have their own seminary, for instance, now. And their seminary, their professor of theology is this side, which is very interesting. No, no, not, not Pelagian, Armenian. Uh, the professor of theology in the Assemblies of God is a, a mid-ground person. He's not Pelagian nor, nor uh, Augustinian. And Tari is, is, is more, he's not quite Armenian. He is practically that, but he leans this way. I'm trying to put middle ground as sort of a midway between these two views. But Tari has a leaning back this way. He, he, you know, he is leaning towards Augustine in his face. See, a lot of these guys, practically, they were not. But if you ask them theoretically, they go, well, yes. 
Bob Mumford, I don't know where Bob is now. I really don't. I know he started here. I know that he started very strongly on this side and I really don't know where he is now. I can't give any statement on Bob Mumford at all. Uh, Finney, we'll put it here in the middle. He's... Uh, we'll look at Finney in a minute. Give you some others. Uh, you may not have known these guys. George Whitfield. Uh, some modern preachers. I'm going to call some modern ones now. Hal Lindsey, way over this side. Uh, Simpson, down here. I'm not sure what Campbell is. I imagine his tradition would be this side, but I'm pretty sure his practice would be more on this side. I really don't know. I've never talked to Campbell on that. Schofield, yes, we sure do. Schofield is well over here. Some modern preachers. Who? I don't, I don't know where Ockham Gay is. I really don't. I've never... Catherine Coleman, this side. Aura Roberts. David Wilkerson. Most of the Pentecostal preachers today are on that side. Yeah. Ralph Wilkerson is more this way. This is R. Uh, Wilkerson. Yes, yeah, I'm putting it. Assemblies of God is the largest Pentecostal denomination per se in the world, though they wouldn't admit that. Um, I'm not sure where the Darmstadt sisters are. They'd be Lutheran, so we'd imagine that theoretically they would be over here. Uh, practically, I don't know where they would be. They'd probably be over this side, practically. A lot of people have two different theologies, the theology they live with and the theology they think they believe. And those are not always the same at all. And they live in what we could call a two-story life. If you ask them theoretically what they believe, they do that. If you ask them practically what they believe, they give you almost the opposite. Billy Graham now. Billy Graham is both sides simultaneously. Billy Graham is both sides simultaneously. I have heard Billy Graham say this. We are sinners by birth. We are sinners by practice. And I think he figures, well, if I say them both, one of them will be right. <laughs> no, not logically, but you don't even have to be logical to be a preacher. So sometimes people simultaneously hold both views. Others, any of you want to... What's that? Bill Garthard? Bill Gothard practically is over here, but I think theoretically he would be more here. And you start to see that come out whenever Gothard goes over to Synesis and gets off Phronesis. Lauren, I'll give you the YWAM view here in a minute. No, I'll, I'm going to set it in its historical perspective in a minute and you get an idea. F.B. Meyer. East Stanley Jones was this side. Jones. And uh, I think Meyer would be probably where Torrey was. A little lean this way. C.S. Lewis, this side. I'm not saying that he was an Armenian, I'm saying that he was in that camp rather than the other camp. Mm -hmm. Yes. But see, Armenians preach that too. Yeah. 
Yes, but we're not talking about that issue. We're talking about the issue of sin. See, we're not talking about the issue of, of the future. We're talking about the issue of sin. If you want to talk about the issue of the future, you might as well put the Armenians under the same camp. Because the, Armenia, the Armenians are illogical in their, in their theology. They hold exactly the same base as the Augustinians, but their answer is different. And in so doing, they become illogical. Which is why most theology schools, when they're trying to teach a logically consistent theology, stick with the Calvinistic side. Even if it's unlivable, at least it's theoretically consistent. Um, for instance, concerning the eternal now thing, I can find for you Armenians who have exactly the same basis as Augustine. And at least John Calvin was consistent, starting with, with his thought forms that what actually was has always been, then John Calvin's theology follows an absolute consistency. It is unlivable, and we could say unthinkable, and many people would say totally unjust, but at least it was logical. Whereas an Armenian who starts with a different base really switches, and uh, he comes to the logical conclusion of his thing, and then he makes a faith jump, and he goes, well, we can't understand that, but nevertheless it is true. St. Francis, he was Catholic, so I guess St. Francis would be more this side. This is a Catholic stream. All Catholic theologians really would. Andrew Murray. Andrew Murray? Murray, I think, would be more in this stream with uh, Meyer and dudes like that. I've never seen Murray's statements on sin. I really don't know. I have quotes from most of these people on, uh, on their sin possessions and stuff. I think you can almost break it up into streams. From a Pentecostal stream there has come a, a, a side more towards the Armenian side. From the, from the Calvinistic stream there has come a lot of the people who are into the Word of God and you know, study and this and that. The guys who mostly try to find hats like clothes racks to hang their clothes on are people that need some form of consistency where they can fit scriptures into. And that's why they chose that side. Now, when you do this with a group of people and show them on the board the widely different views that Christians have had over the ages, you do one key thing, you show them that there is no single view that is anointed. It's important to see that. Because then it no longer becomes an issue of absolutely what was true versus heresy. It is a matter of what you believe is true. Do you see that? In other words, when you start contrasting ministries like this, you can find dudes on both sides of the line who had great anointings on their ministry. They preached with power, people were saved, and that was it. George Whitfield was just as good a preacher, if not better a preacher, than John Wesley. And so, whether a person loves God and preaches the gospel or not, and even has people saved or not, does not really have a vast amount to do with his theology. Where I do think a change takes place is what happens after to the people and how you keep them in the kingdom of God. That's where the change takes place. In other words, it is perfectly possible for somebody to take a straight Augustinian view and preach some form of gospel message. And a modern Calvinist can do that. Not strictly a John Calvin Calvinist, but more like a Jonathan Edwards Calvinist. Jonathan Edwards was kind of a little different from Calvin and most modern evangelical Calvinists are really Edwardian Calvinists and not Augustinian Calvinists. Jonathan Edwards had a classic thing on the freedom of the will in which he modified his Calvinism to allow for evangelical activity. And that was a little different from John Calvin. John Calvin was not an evangelist. He was a lawyer. But Jonathan Edwards was an evangelist and he could not preach 
Calvin Calvinism and get results. So he changed it, became his own brand. And most modern Calvinists who are evangelical are Edwardian Calvinists who believe there is a certain freedom of the will to choose. But they still tie back to the original premises. Okay, having given you all that, Let us go to the early church and see what they said about this problem. I suggest you draw up your own little chart on this. Another thing you could do as a project is to get quotes from various people and the people that are dead, of course, the living ones will keep moving around. Um, perfectly possible for somebody to have a theological view and two years later have the exact opposite one. And uh, for three years I preached on that side. Had a lot of fun but not much results. A lot of people came forward and not many people stayed. And then I changed. Bam. So it's quite possible for people to change views. And uh, doing it all the time today. And we hope that an awful lot of people change their views if we're going to see reformation take place in the world. Now I'm going to give it the early church's view because this is very important for one reason. We were going to go back before Augustine. We're going to go back before any theological issues um, concerning the freedom of choice and all of this were at stake. We're going to go back to the first 300 years after Christ. Now we can go into the scriptures fairly soon and argue about what the scriptures mean when they say various things, but what we are going to look at first is the concurrency of, a, of statement of the early church concerning this question. Is the will free or not? In Augustine, it is not. Not unless God gives you a special gift of faith. Then you will become free. It is not free to do anything except sin in Augustine's thought form. Now, the word free will is not a Bible word. It is coined like the word Trinity by the early church to describe something that was obviously taught in Scripture. Now, we may not like the word free will taught by the Pelagian emphasis on it. might put people off that. But nevertheless, they still use that term free will in the early church. Here are the three basic ideas that the early church fathers got across. And we find this in all the following schools. Even though these guys may have totally disagreed with each other in other areas, they all agreed on these one, three things that we have on the board. And I'll give you the schools they came from. Alexandria, Antioch, Carthage, Jerusalem. These are all the theological schools of the day. Lycia, Nasa. Nice, I don't even know how to say that. Nice. Wrong. Okay. All of the main theological schools agreed on these three things. Just as today people agree in all the main theological schools, there is such a thing as a virgin birth, the resurrection of Jesus Christ, the inspiration of scriptures. These were held to be basic truths. Truth one. The rejection of free will, the rejection of the idea of free will, is the view of heretics. One. Two. Free will is a gift given to man by God. For nothing can be ever independent of God. 
ultimately. In other words, it must have come from some place and that place would have to come from God because, well, remember our chart now? Create Tor going up. The last one, man has free will because he is made in God's image. And God has free will. That's the three major things they all agreed on. Nobody argued about those three things. They all accepted them. Up to the time of Augustine, that was the teaching for the first 350, 60 years of the early church. Now I'm going to give you quotes from various people, tell you who they were, and just give you one or two quotes. You may have to scribble fairly fast in this because we, um, we haven't got time to read out all that they said. First guy is Justin Martyr. He lived between, he was born about 100 in the AD, about 65 died. And Renwick, who is an Augustinian scholar, calls Justin the greatest of the early apologists, a most earnest Christian and a true lover of learning. Quaston calls him the most important of the Greek apologists of the second century and one of the noblest personalities of early Christian literature. And uh, Justin was a philosopher. He had uh, tried all kinds of different philosophy schools and remained unsatisfied. And then in Ephesus, he met an old man who talked to him about Jesus. And a fire was kindled in his heart and still wearing his philosopher's cloak, he went out and began to preach as a Christian. And he won many to the Lord. Finally, a rival philosopher who was an anti-Christian anti accused him before the city prefect of being a Christian. The prefect threatened Justin with flogging and execution and jeeringly asked him if he thought he would ascend to heaven. Justin replied, I don't think so. I know and am fully persuaded of it. And then he was martyred. So that was Justin. Um, he mentions the word free will in many works, the sovereignty of God, but here is this dialogue in the, the, the book Dialogue. God, wishing men and angels to follow his will, resolved to create them free to do righteousness. But if the word of God foretells that some angels and men shall certainly be punished, it did so because it foreknew they would be unchangeably wicked, but not because God created them so. See this word? Not because God created them so so that if they repent, all who wish for it can obtain mercy from God. All who wish for it can obtain mercy from God. There is a man who says the exact opposite of what John Calvin later came to teach, that God himself created sin, that he brought into being sin, that he originated it. Next dude we'll give you is... Irenaeus. He came from Gaul and he lived in this state between 130 and 200 AD. And he was one of the first of the, of the great fathers of the period from between 180 and 250. He was a disciple of Polycarp. This guy was a disciple of Polycarp and Polycarp was trained by St. John, Apostle John. So, you know, it must be really... A, look back at these dudes. John won Polycarp to the Lord and trained him and Polycarp trained this dude. So there's second, like the grandchildren, spiritual grandchildren of Apostle John. And then... He wrote a book called Against Heresies. It really helped the church in its early years to fight some really rotten things that came up in it. And a, a tremendously important work. He, he uh, 
He was kind of like the Walter Martin of his day. This was his kingdom of the cults. And in his book, uh, he was dealing with the Gnostics, who are a new sect that came up, and he said this. He quotes a scripture, how often, this expression, how often would I have gathered thy children together, and thou wouldst not, set forth the ancient law of human liberty, because God made man a free agent, you can fill in, free agent, from the beginning, possessing his own soul to obey the behests of God voluntarily and not by compulsion of God. For there is no coercion with God, no force, but a good will towards us is present with him continually. And therefore does he give good counsel to all. And in man as well as in angels he has placed the power of choice. For angels are rational beings, so that those who had yielded obedience might justly possess what is good, given indeed by God, but preserved by themselves. If then it were not in our power to do or not to do these things, what reason had the Apostle and much more the Lord himself to give us counsel to do some things and to abstain from others? But because man is possessed of free will from the beginning and God is possessed of free will in whose likeness man was created, advice is always given to him to keep fast the good, which thing is done by means of obedience to God. Next dude. I'll just take quotes of different guys. Athanagoras. Athenagoras came from Athens. He lived in the second century. He was one of the most elegant and uh, one of the uh, most ablest of the early Christian apologeticists. And uh, he wrote his book, The Embassy, about 177 AD. And it was called The Embassy for Christians. And this is a a very neat little statement. Just as with men who have freedom of choice, as to both virtue and vice, for you would not either honor the good or punish the bad unless vice and virtue were in their own power. It's really a neat little thing. You would not honor the good nor punish the bad if not vice and virtue were in their own power. And some are diligent in the matters entrusted to them and others faithless, so it is among the angels. So he's, he's taken it up to the angelic realm, bringing it down to the human realm. Yes? Can I ask for a little clarification in terms of, uh, are we still on original sin? Yeah, we're dealing with free will. I want, we're not getting on to sin yet. I'm showing you, the, showing you the base of where the sin concepts came from. In other words, we're dealing, first of all, with the question, is the will free? If it isn't, then we can forget um, even talking about any other sides of it. If the will was once thought of as free, then the teaching that man does not have a free will and that his will is in some way enslaved and requires special gifts from God is a historical position that has been sustained right from the early church all the way through. If not, and, and we're saying it is not, then the teaching that the will is enslaved and is unable to make the right choices is an interjection into Christian history and though being popular for the last 1,500 years was not the first view of the church and not the popular view. Never was. Um, now we give you Theophilus of Antioch. He came from Antioch, Theophilus. About 169 A.D. He was the first writer who used the term Trinity concerning the Godhead. And writing to a guy called Auto, Autolycus, he wrote these words, For God made man free, and by apprehending him lay aside your old nature, 
We were not created to die, but we die by our own fault. Our free will has destroyed us. We who were free have become slaves. We have been sold through sin. Nothing evil had been created by God. We ourselves have manifested wickedness. But we who have manifested it are able again to reject it. And then, um, from his little word fragment, how is it that God did not so make us that we should not sin and in incur condemnation? If man had been made so, he would not have belonged to himself, but would have been the instrument of him that moved him. And how in that case would a man differ from a harp on which another plays, or from a ship which another guides? Where the praise and the blame reside in the hand of the performer or the seersman, they being own instruments made for the use of him in whom is skill. But God in his benignity chose not so to make man, but by freedom he exalted him above many of his creatures. There again, a total rejection of the idea that man is just a, a placing in the hands of God. Now, today this word comes through very strongly in secular culture. Game, game, game. John Lennon, mind games forever. That life is a game. It's a big old game. Somebody else is playing it. Monopoly. One day, you slam the board up and that's it. But in the Bible, it is no game. There is real choices taking place. Now, Clement of Alexandria. Most of you will at least have heard some of these early church fathers. Clement was born 150 AD and he lived to about 215 AD. He was a presbyter, not a Presbyterian, but a presbyter of tremendous learning, both of the Bible and of secular literature. This dude was a really wide red dude. He was for some time head of the Alexandrian school of Christian scholars and is one of the most famous of the early Christian writers. He has sometimes been accused of placing too much stress on the intellect, but we find this criticism hard to accept. For one thing, most Christian theologians and apologists place an emphasis on right belief, especially in arguing against heresy. For another, Clement repeatedly makes it clear that faith is a moral issue and a matter of decision for Christ. In Stromata, Book 2, Chapter 2, he argues strongly that faith is not established by demonstration. Faith involves a choice, and choice is the beginning of action shortly after we read. Dramata, Book 2, Chapter 4. But we who have heard by the Scriptures that self-determining choice and refusal have been given by the Lord to men rest in the infallible criteria of faith, manifesting a willing spirit since we have chosen life and believe God through His voice. But nothing is without the will of the Lord in the universe. It remains to say that such things happen without the prevention of God. For this alone saves both the providence and the goodness of God. We must not therefore think that he actively produced afflictions, be far from it we should think this, but we must be persuaded that he does not prevent those that cause them, but overrules for good the crimes of his enemies. He does not originate awful things that happen, but when they do happen, he overrules for good the crimes of his enemies. There is again determining, self-determining choice. Here's Tertullian. He is a Latin theologian and that puts him right in the background of Augustine. And from Carthage, 155 to 225. The first great Latin theologian, one of the greatest of the early Christian writers of the West. Now, here we have a statement by Tertullian. Man was indicating the presence of God's image and likeness in him by nothing so well as by the constitution of his nature. You will find that when he sets before man good and evil, life and death, that the entire course of discipline is arranged in precepts by God's calling men from sin, threatening and exhorting them, 
and this on no other ground than that man is free with a will either for obedience or resistance. I'll give you a couple more quick ones because I have a large number here and I don't want to go through them all day. We'll give you Oregon from 185 to 254 AD. Renwick, again, called him one of the most brilliant teachers and writers ever known in the Christian church. The son of a martyr and reared in a fine spiritual atmosphere became head of a teaching school at the age of 18 and raised it to its highest fame in spite of persecution. He loved the scriptures and showed remarkable ability in interpreting them. F.F. F. Bruce says, Greater still than Tertullian innovation was the Alexandrian theologian Oregon, the greatest scholar and thinker of the church in the first three centuries. And here is a, a statement from De Print. Scipius preface. Now it ought to be known that the holy apostles on preaching the faith of Christ delivered themselves with the utmost clearness on certain points which they believed to be necessary to everyone. Thus also, is, this also is clearly defined in the teaching of the church that every rational soul is possessed of free will and volition. And then one last guy. This is not a very important guy. He's just a little bishop. Name was Methodius. He came from Olympus. He was born in 260 and he was martyred in 311. They put him to death. Now, the strangest thing is this. He was an antagonist, an antagonist of Origen. He, you know, he didn't agree with a lot of what Origen said. He argued and fought with him. But the wild thing is, on one point he did agree with Origen. All early Christians did. Free will. In the banquet of the ten virgins, this little bishop says, Now, those who decide that man is not possessed of free will and affirm that he is governed by the unavoidable necessities of fate, a guilty of impiety towards God himself, making him out to be the cause and author of human evil. And then he says, concerning free will, I say that man was made with free will, not as if there were already existing some evil which he had the power of choosing if he wished, but that the power of obeying and disobeying God is the only cause. Now, how many of you heard this? What a mystery. Where did evil come from in the universe? Where, you know, the mystery of evil. How did evil originate? It is only a mystery if you think evil must pre-exist in order for it to be there. In other words, in order to be evil, you have to pre-choose an existing evil. It is not a mystery if you see that the actual creation of a choice against highest value is evil in itself. And this is no new thought because that's precisely what this dude is saying. Read it again. I say that man was made with free will, not as if there were already existing some evil which he had the power of choosing if he wished, but that the power of obeying and disobeying God is the only cause. Archelaus disputed with the dude Mayonnaise, who was not Mayonnaise, but Mayonnaise. And in that disputation he said, for all creatures that God made, he made very good. He gave to every individual the sense of free will in accordance with which standard he also instituted the law of judgment. To sin is ours and that we sin not as God's gift, as our will is constituted to choose either to sin or not to sin. So there's screeds and screeds and screeds of dudes who said the same thing. And there's others here, but we won't go on. Just... Mm. 
That was, wasn't Oregon, that was Methodius. I'll say that again. Methodius, that's that second bishop. Oregon said this, there's also clearly defined in the teaching of the church that every rational soul is possessed of free will and violation. It's not volition, it's violation. Ability to choose or to refuse. And um, Methodius said this, I say that man was made with free will, not as if there were already existing some evil which he had the power of choosing if he wished, but the power of obeying and disobeying God is the only cause. Now, I want you to see how the early Christian church's teaching strongly parallels those lines of those two things I've given you. I mentioned to you this thought form that when God made man, he made a creator, a miniature finite creator, who was able in his own being to originate choices. Those choices that come into reality against the greatest value of what God has said, this is where it's at, actually originate evil. And that's the base of this. We want to, why don't you take a break now and then I want to come back and show you the change that Augustine brought in to Christian thinking. Since some of you asked, I'll explain what, what we're doing and why I'm doing it the way I'm doing it. The reason why we're beginning historically and not biblically is because this issue is one that is a historical issue and you can find Bible verses to quote-unquote prove a point on both sides. The reason I'm giving it to you like this, as we mentioned at half time. Sounds like a boxing match, doesn't it? The reason I'm giving it to you like this is to demonstrate that it is a view which has been held and argued about on both sides of the line by Christians for centuries. Therefore, just because you hold a view does not mean to say you are the sole repository of truth in the world. Now... What we're trying to do in giving a historical perspective is to help you understand the original issues and then why those issues came up, who was responsible for those issues, and knowing the originals, then you can see how the things begun and uh, also this, you can go back into the scriptures then and look at it from a more open point of view. I mentioned a lot of times when I'm teaching in churches concerning this subject, here is a kid, he sat under a Bible teacher for a whole two months. Bible teacher has given him an Augustinian view and has carefully laid it out to him, quoted various proof texts to prove why it's right. Kid is sitting there and that's all he's ever heard. He thinks that the Bible teacher is right on and that his position is the only Christian position and that anybody else is out to lunch. Now it is no good you coming in and giving scriptures from the other side at this point because the kid's problem is not scriptures. If you give him scripture, he'll just go, well, you know, there must, must be another translation on that or something. He's not interested in scripture. He already has seven that prove that he's right. What his problem is is prejudice, bias. And the only thing that corrects bias and prejudice is exposure to a lot more information that he's had before. Which is why we start historically. By going historically, first of all, you show him what he did not know before. That this view that we are dealing with this morning is a view that has had proponents for the last 1,500 years on both sides of the line. And therefore... When he sees dudes on both sides of the question, he can't say, well, I am right because I am historically, biblically always right. Look at all the people on my side. He sees the others who are doing equal things and sometimes more, and he says, uh-oh, you mean there is another side and you can still get blessed by having that side. Then later when we come to the scriptures, which we're going to come to, 
from a historical perspective, his seven proof texts do not look as solid as he thought they were. Because he realizes over 1,500 years, quite a few people must have looked at those scriptures. And that he is not as om omniscient as he thought he was. And once a person is more open to listening to scriptures from the other side, you can give them to him and not until. Which is why I've started the way I've started. I'm going to take you back now to the original issue. The way this was first introduced in the church. Augustine's thought form, why he said what he said, and the results of that in the early church. Now, I'm going to show you two connected with this why I think Augustine did what he did. If there was such an early agreement in the church concerning free will, how did the change ever take place? Well, three men... Ambrose, Oregon, and Jerome. These are three key men. They were all of the opinion that God dispenses his grace among men according to the use which he foresees that each will make of it. Now, this is not an issue of will yet. It's an issue of foreknowledge. And notice what this is related to now. We are now dealing with a different concept, a concept of time being static in the being of God, a different area of theology, and yet one linked back into this. We've already looked at that thought form that time has no... Uh, meaning to God that past, present, future are all the same. Okay, with this in mind, Ambrose, Oregon and Jerome were the three Christian leaders out of all the rest of the church that just had a theory that maybe God gives his grace to people according to the use that he foresees they will make of it. Now what we're having now is the time question intruding in the choice question for the first time. Now this is not a statement of fact, it's an opinion that these three church fathers ventured. Maybe God foresees that people will do this and that. Maybe he gives grace according to the use he sees they will make of it. Not gives them grace in order to do it, but gives them grace according to what he sees they will do with it. It's a subtle difference. But right here, I want you to look at these three men. Who is Jerome? Who was Ambrose? Ambrose was the dude who baptized Augustine. He was his spiritual father. The guy he looked up to, the guy who put him into the ministry, who first baptized him. That was Ambrose. Who was Jerome? Jerome was the guy who did the first Latin translation of the Greek. Jerome was the man responsible for putting into Latin the Greek Bible. The Puritan and New Testament. He put it into Latin so that Latin people could read it. What did um, Augustine know about Greek? Nothing. He hated it. What he, he knew a bit, you know, you know, he knew a little Greek, ran a delicatessen shop down the road. <laughs> Hebrew, he knew zero. He did know Latin. That was his native language. The translation that Augustine had to build his theology from was Jerome's translation. Now these are important things. They're significant. Jerome and Ambrose and Oregon were the three men that first ventured this thought. Maybe God gives his grace according to the use that he foresees people will make of it. With that vague idea in the back of his mind, or 
Augustine growing up as a new Christian, now he becomes to a place of power, now he becomes a place where he's a spokesman for the church, he's doing a lot of preaching, a lot of writing. Augustine makes a change concerning will. And that's the change that he moves into. His early view, interestingly enough, tied more in with the early church teaching. His early view was this view. And then he felt, after studying it, and I think from the influence of these three things, that his view may not have been the correct view and actually changed the whole structure of early church history. I'm going to give you now a statement by Augustine. I labored indeed on behalf of the free choice of the human will, but God's grace overcame. And I could only teach that point where the apostle is perceived to have said with the most evident truth, for who makes you to differ, and what do you have that you have not received? Now if you have received it, why do you glory as if you received it not? And the martyr Cyprian was also desirous of setting forth faith then, as well as in its beginning, as in its completion, as God's gift, and let no one have any doubt where, whatever, unless he desires to resist the plainer scriptures, that this gift is given to some, while to some it is not given. Now there are three things I want you to notice from the statement. First, Augustine notices that he has had a change of view. The view that he said he formerly labored for was the orthodox original Christian view and he changed it. He knows that he's changed it. Secondly, it seems like that Augustine is really unaware of how radically he is broken from the early church's teaching. He knows that, that he originally used to think that, now he's made a statement, he does not seem to be aware that he is alone in making this statement. He is citing Cyprian for his quote, but the interesting thing is this. Though Cyprian is the least clear of all the leading early Christians, there is no statement by Cyprian that faith is an irresistible gift. None at all. In the passage that Augustine cites, which is supposed to have been from Cyprian, Cyprian is speaking in as general a sense as Paul himself and does not state at all Augustine's view. Yet Augustine may have believed that Cyprian really held such views and he himself seems to have known little about early Christian writings. In other words, Augustine did not study the writings of the men around him. He heard them secondhand, picked it up here, picked it up there. His quote-unquote quote of Cyprian is not a quote at all. It is an interpolation, which Cyprian does not say. Thus he may not have realized at all the extent of how radically he was departing from what the other church taught. He probably thought that other people thought it too and he was just saying it in a different way. And then thirdly, it is important to see that this is not an issue of faith and works. No question here that the early church believed that salvation came by works. These two issues are often confused when you're dealing with the choice of man's will. People often mix up faith and works, but it never was. Now, I'm going to give you the, what I believe the early church's biblical teaching on this issue. The early church did not believe that man had been given free will to earn salvation by works. Didn't believe that. I'll give you the view here. See if I can nail it down. And I'm going to quote you Augustine's early view. This is what he had before he changed. I think it's an accurate summary of the biblical view. For it is ours to believe.
and to will. But it is his to give to those who believe the power of doing good works through the Holy Spirit. I believe that's closest to the biblical view. It is not Augustinian. Faith is an irresistible gift. It is not Pelagian. It is ours to believe and to choose. That is free choice, genuine, responsible choice. But it is his to give to those who believe the power of doing good works through the Holy Spirit. Give me a scripture that tells us that in John chapter 1. But to as many as received him, to them gave he the power to become the sons of God. Do you see that? But to as many as received him. That's choice. That's not what God does. That's what men do. Many as believe, receive, trust, give their lives to him. To those ones who believe, choose, he gives power to become the sons of God. They cannot become the sons of God on their own. Their choices alone are not enough to change their lives. They require divine power and divine change and divine strength and divine help and divine grace. But the choices are really theirs. You can set your will towards Rome and open your world to the satanic world. You can set your will towards God and open your world to the biblical world and the Christian will. Your will is free to choose. But when chosen, when you've chosen your choice, power comes into your life from one side or the other. And the point is this. A real Christian view is this, that we need God not only to teach us, but to empower us and to live through us and live in us to live the kind of life that God calls us to live. In other words, God did not design man to live alone. That is a biblical position on salvation. Yes. That's early Augustine. That's Augustine's first view before he changed and came up to the irresistible gift of faith view. What's that? Um, I probably would if I had the appendix notes here, but my notes, my appendix notes only go to 23 and I couldn't quite give it to you. I've, I've got, uh, these are only photocopies I'm carrying with me and I have only, the footnotes on the appendix only go to 27 footnotes and this thing, that's a quote from 47, which is 20 down the line. Otherwise I could give it to you. <laughs> that's Augustine's first view. That's first view. Where, why did Augustine change his view? I'll give you two reasons why he changed his view. But can you see the first one was this time question begin to affect Augustine. Can you see that if time is simultaneous to God, then there is no such thing as foreknowledge. It is all present. And therefore when God does give grace to men, he is now giving what he would already give and always will give. Therefore he has selected some out to be saved. That's the way it comes. Now we're having the interjection of the time question coming into the will question. And that is what's beginning to mold Augustine's thought. He does not realize how radically different he is here. He still thinks that his idea is just a clarification of what one or two other Bible teachers are teaching. But he is changing something concerning will and the reason why he's changing it is because of his ideas of God's time. 
which is why these two questions are really tied together in a very important way. When you deal with choice, you automatically get into, if you're thinking right through, the time question. All right? I think the three reasons, first of all, because he did not know that what he was saying was really radical. He thought it was what other people were saying too. Second thing is, I th we'll, we'll, we'll deal with the, uh, the, the theology that he got from his Latin translation that, that built his entire theology from, uh, the, the uh, translation that his whole thoughts came out on. But the second reason is this. He began to inject into the question of choice the question of God's time. And by thinking God never did anything after anything, the succession-less thing, which Augustine strongly held, and a couple of the other church fathers also thought like that, by pushing the two together, he began to affect what the early church fathers never taught on, freedom of will. And he began to tie this fatalistic thought form into the will and therefore made the will determined. So what happens is uh, a theory in another part begins to affect his thought forms that he's teaching and he begins to radically depart from what the other church taught, what the rest of the church taught, thinking that he's just quoting Cyprian, he's not quoting him at all. So, in other words, what we've got is Augustine for the first time starts bringing in ideas that a couple of the other church fathers have thought of, but marries them into the human will and begins to change the whole idea of the human will and whether it is free or not. Now, I think this view is the one that will be most honored by God and I think the other two views are heretical. Now, that's my statement. I think Augustine's view is as heretical as Pelagian's view. But in the world of Christians today, Augustine's view is almost accepted as one biblical alternative. And Pelagian, the Pelagian view, of course, is treated as heretical, and rightly so. But I believe that Augustine's view is just as heretical as Pelagian's view. And that it cannot be substantiated in practice and that when we look at the scriptures Augustine used horrible scriptures to try and prove this I don't even want to quote a lot of them because they're awful for instance one of the main verses he used was go out into the highways and byways and compel them to come in which meant, in his thinking, God forces people to get saved. Therefore, the Christians ought to too. Go out and make them Christians. If God uses force to change man's will, then so can his people do the same thing. And we'll see the horrible results that came in history because of this. All right. Now let me give you the reason or the base of this departure. See if I can find it here. Augustine's main repeated line of argument from his system may be summarized briefly as follows. Here's where Augustine got his original sin position from. All Christians agree that babies are baptized to regenerate them into Christ's body, the Catholic Church. First statement, August. All Christians agree that baptize, the babies are baptized to regenerate them. No, this is Augustine's view now. We're summing up Augustine's view and his unique presentation and how he comes from this back into what he's going to say later. Baptize the babies to regenerate them um, into Christ's body, which was the Catholic Church.
All Christians agree, Augustine would have thought. Having made that statement, these are the two things that he got from it. First of all, this shows they are born under the guilt of sin committed in Adam. And I'll show you the scripture he used in a minute. He says, therefore, they are born under the guilt of sin in Adam. That's why they have to be baptized to regenerate them into Christ's body. And secondly, the determination of who should be regenerated does not depend on the will of those selected. In other words, you get a baby and you baptize it. The baby has no say in that. What, who has the say is the one who brings it to be baptized. Therefore, the salvation of the baby does not depend on the baby. It depends on the will of another. Augustine believed that it didn't matter really who baptized the baby because if a drunken heretic baptized the baby, the baby would be saved by the faith of the church and not by the drunken heretic. But notice it was somebody else's will that was saving this baby. That's the argument he used. Now, we would think that it would go in reverse. In other words, that if babies are born under the guilt of sin and Adam, therefore you would... Be but the, he actually, his practice was to argue from the other side. This is a common teaching, therefore it shows these two things. Now, can you see from this point what happened? It was a very simple, it began to become a hard-line doctrine then. You must baptize a baby or it will be damned. It will go to hell under the guilt of Adam. And secondly, salvation does not take place having anything to do with the choice of the person who gets saved. It has to do with the will of another. And then Augustine said, what is true of babies must also be true of adults. God selects some to be regenerated on some basis known only to him and not dependent on their own will. That's Augustine's main line of argument. This, if you like, is philosophical. It's not scriptural yet. We'll try and show you the scriptures that he tried to use. It's just, again, philosophical. Here we are. We're going to baptize a baby to save it. That proves two things. First, it needs to be saved and it's not its own guilt. It must be the guilt of sin committed in Adam. Secondly, the fact that it's getting saved by somebody else means that salvation is not dependent on the choice of the person who's being saved but on somebody else. What is true of babies must be true of adults. God must select some to regenerate them on some basis known only to himself and that is why salvation comes about like that. Now, the early church never doubted the seriousness of Adam's fall or Adam's sin but Augustine gave it an entirely different interpretation. He taught that when Adam sinned, all his descendants sinned in Adam and so shared the guilt. Yeah, this is more scriptural now. This, well, put scriptural in quotes. We have now dealt with, if you like, the reasoning from, from practical things. In other words, Augustine said, see what we do, we're baptizing babies. This proves a couple of things. Bam. Then, this is the scriptures he had to base this major line of argument on it. The support for Augustine's thought that all men sinned in Adam and that's why they were guilty as babies came from a Latin translation of Romans 5.12. I'm going to give you this in Latin and in Greek. Somebody want to read that from the King James or the New American Standard or any modern version? Yeah. 
Hmm, what is that? That's the Living Bible. Other, other translation? Amplified. Amplified. Uh, therefore, as sin came into the world through one man, and death is the result of sin, so death spread to all men, no one being able to stop it or to escape its power because all men sin. Okay. Who's got, uh, anybody got the NISB? The American Standard? Read it out. Therefore, just as through the one man, through one man, sin entered into the world, and death through sin, and so death spread to all men, because all men sin. Because all men sin. Now the phrase we're looking at, this phrase here, in Greek, translated... Um, Because that, yeah. This is what Augustine had in his Latin version from Jerome. Watch. New Zealand, as part of our course in science, we had to take Latin. I thought it was a ridiculous idea. But where would I ever get to use Latin? Well, I discovered half of Catholic theology is written in Latin. I never thought, good friends, I'd ever use it. And if you've ever taken Latin, you know what omnis means? This word is to be put to blame, percoverant, we use translated sin. And what do you think this phrase, translated literally in Latin, says? In whom all have sinned. That is the translation Augustine had sitting in front of him to build his theology from. In whom all have sinned. Now that word in whom, that phrase in whom, now remember Augustine didn't have Greek, he only had Latin. He simply had that word. Just like picking up a living Bible and reading something there and you go, well, that's what it says. It says it here. That must be what it is. And this in whom can only refer to one person in this phrase. That's Adam. And so Augustine was perfectly logical in finding a support, a, what he thought was a biblical support for his idea. Now, his philosophy said we all baptize babies. It shows they must have been, you know, have some guilt. And that guilt can't come from, there, it comes from somebody else. Aha, my Bible says here, in him all have sinned. Therefore, in Adam all the human race have sinned. Federal head, if you want to call it that, since he was the head of the whole race, treated as, or sometimes because physically he was the father of the human race, then physically all the children from Adam are all sinners too. And are born like that and are treated guilty because of that. And sitting in front of him was a translation that said scripturally now that. Do you see? In other words, if you wanted to ask Augustine, where do you get this weird idea from? He'd say, weird what the Bible teaches. And that's what I'm talking about. You can tell people, listen, this is what it says. And they go, well, my Bible doesn't say that. But the trouble is, that little reading, F-O, was not contested for 1,000 years. It just sat there. And in that 1,000 years, the church wrote theology. For a thousand years the church wrote theology. And nobody even challenged it. They just sat there from Augustine all the way down to humanism. The translation was in whom? It was Erasmus who first pointed out that F.O. never means in whom, but because that. Which most of your translations even including the King James, have something like that. Nobody translates that today in whom. 
But Augustine had it like that. And from that base, a thousand years of church theology was written. Augustine, Calvin, Luther, and so on. The Latin, that was Jerome. Yeah, the Latin was Jerome's translation. Do you remember Jerome? The other one of those three guys that, that had the idea that God dispenses his grace according to what he foresees men will make of it out of the, all of the early church leaders, those three guys. Jerome was the one who gave Augustine a translation. Ambrose was his spiritual father and Oregon was the only other guy they had in the deal. The Latin church. Now, I have here also a study from the Catholic church is original sin in scripture. It's a very interesting thing because it's an in-depth study of the original debate in all of early church history among that and the guy sums up in the end by saying the Bible does not teach that men are born guilty. Let me show you what they said in Augustine's time though that became a very interesting thing. Um, somebody came along and asked an embarrassing question. If the guilt of sinning in Adam was removed by baptism and that a person who was baptized as a child had the sin of Adam wiped away from him and his guilt, here was the problem. What if you started with two Christian parents who had both been baptized? Wouldn't it be true that then they, because the guilt of both of them and Adam had been cleansed by baptism, that the child of these two parents would be born Christian and therefore not require baptism? In other words, all you need to do is baptize the original two members of a family and the rest of the family from that time on would be born Christian. Augustine had an interesting dual answer to this problem. The first one was this. It is quite possible, this is a quote, for parents to transmit to their children that which they do not possess themselves. Now I'll say it again. It is quite possible for parents to transmit to their children that which they do not possess themselves. When you do not understand, then you will know. <laughs> His second line of argument went like this. Children are born in Satan's power because, quote, they are born of the union of the sexes which cannot even accomplish its own honorable function without the incidence of shameful lust. Augustine taught that sexual intercourse from any other motive other than procreation was a venial sin and that the act was always shameful since it was always tinged with passion. Thus only Christ, he said, was born pure since only he was conceived without sexual intercourse. And that was Augustine's second line of defense on that thought. The children are born in Satan's power because of the shameful passion that accompanies the sexual act. All right, now we go to infant baptism. In baptism, a baby is forgiven the guilt of original sin. Quote, as nothing else is done for children in baptism but their being incorporated into the church that is connected with the body and members of Christ, it follows that when this is not done for them, they belong to perdition. This is page 214 on God's strategy in human history. It, in, as nothing else is done for children in baptism, but they're being put into the church, it follows that that, when this is not done for them, they go to hell. In other words, a baptized baby would go to heaven if he died, but an unbaptized one to hell. Whatever Christians today believe about infant baptism, most usually reject this idea of baptismal regeneration of a child. 
Now, going to give you another key thing here, and this is on predestination and election in Augustine's thought form. Election, Augustine, because of this thing here, now became this, God's choice of who should be believers. Predestination in Augustine's thought form became preparation for grace. While gra for grace, while grace is the actual endowment or gift. Now, you can see where he got this from, see? You argue back, baptized baby, thought forms, that quote thing. Now, God, tie in the, the, knowledge, the uh, fact that, the supposed fact God is an eternal now thing, and then you come from here. Then election must be God's choice of who should be believers, known only to himself. Predestination is their preparation to receive this grace which God would one day give them. Yes? That plus the scripture that he had. Well, I'm not sure why they did that, but the Latin church seemed to do a lot of that sort of thing. Yeah, in other words, there was not a... Uh, yes. Could have well been that. That's really in good, Bob. Um, did all of you hear that? The, that... Uh, Possibly the early Catholic Church's teaching on baptism came as a compliment to a Hebrew's dedication of a child in the temple. They baptized him in the same way as Christ was baptized in the River Jordan. But from that, uh, a different picture came out. It's really, an, I didn't know that. It's really an interesting thing. Okay. So election then in Augustine's thing, becomes selection. Selection with no reference of the, to their own will, of those who would be given final salvation. And predestination would become just simply preparation for God's finally giving an irresistible gift of faith and perseverance. God could have chosen and predestined others but for undisclosed reasons, did not do so. This is Augustine's basic teaching. Now you can see, probably most of you, when you think of those things, think of John Calvin, but they're not original with Calvin. Augustine began them. He was the one who started, and all that Calvin did is put them in a more logical, carefully written out framework. And this uh, character who wrote this study said it is unfortunate that such pre interpretations of election and predestination are often accepted today even by those who know nothing of Augustine as the true biblical ones. Instead of taking care to see whether the ideas are truly biblical, people often merely soften their implications by saying that of course such doctrines are only one side to the truth. This is highly unsatisfactory for it is far from obvious that Augustine's interpretation of these concepts are biblical. Now, um, I'm going to give you now just a couple of other, other things. Here's some of Augustine's exposition on that thought form and he's exegeting the scriptures now to prove what he's saying. According, we must now inquire about the meaning of what was said most truly by the apostle concerning God who wills that all men should be saved. Now you can imagine what Augustine did when he found some of these other scriptures. 
God who wills all men to be saved. And you now he thinks, uh-oh, here is the statement that God wishes, chooses all men to be saved. And yet I, wow. So this is what he says. For since not all, not even a majority, are saved, it would indeed appear that the fact what God wills to happen does not happen is due to an embargo on God's will by the human will. Now when we ask for the reason why not all are saved, the customary answer is because they themselves have not willed it. But this cannot be said of infants who have not yet come to the power of willing or not willing. For if we could attribute to their wills the infant squirmings they make at baptism, when they resist as hard as they can, we would then have to say they were saved against their will. According, when we hear and read in sacred scripture that God wills that all men should be saved, although we know well enough that not all men are saved, we are not on that account to underrate the fully omnipotent will of God. Rather, we must understand the scripture who will have all men to be saved as meaning that no man is saved unless God wills his salvation. Not that there is no man whose salvation he does not will, but that no one is saved unless he will it. It's kind of tricky, this. Thus also we are to understand what is written in the gospel about him who enlightens every man. This is John 1, 9, the true light that lighteth every man that cometh into the world. This means that there is no man who is enlightened except by God. These guys say, we are amazed by these arguments, which is, one, it looks as though God's will that all shall be saved is not done. Two, but babies are saved in baptism against their wills. Three, the fully omnipotent will of God must not be underrated. Four, therefore the words, God wills that all men should be saved, must really mean any man that God wills should be saved will be. Exactly. But do you see what I'm saying? That's why I started historically and not biblically. Because I can give a scripture to a group of people who are Augustinian, who've got all little scriptures about this, that, and the other thing, and I can say, here's a scripture, God wills that all men should be saved. And they go, well, well, that probably means something else. Probably actually means that well, if God wills somebody to be saved, then he... Now, the interesting thing is, is Augustine's arguments are not biblical. One appeals to common Christian practice. You noticed how the babies squirm. The second one is to God's almightiness. God is almighty. Are you saying that he... See, and you just... People go, well, look how the babies squirm. That's very practical. And who is to say that God is not almighty? You know, and that's very emotional. Nobody in their mind would stand and go, God is not almighty. But notice his arguments are not biblically based. They're emotional. I'll give you a couple of others like this. Um, these are the great works of the Lord well considered in all his acts of will and so wisely well considered when his angelic and human creation sinned that is did not do what he willed but what it willed he could still accomplish what he himself had willed and this through the same creaturely will by which the first act contrary to the creature's will had been done. You can imagine why people went to sleep. <laughs> As the supreme good he made good use of evil deeds for the damnation of those whom he had justly predestined to punishment and for the salvation of those whom he had mercifully predestined to grace. For as far as it relates to themselves, these creatures did what God wished not to be done, but in view of God's omnipotence, they could in no wise effect their purpose. For in the very fact that they acted in opposition to his will, his will concerning them was fulfilled. And hence it is said that the works of the Lord are great, well considered in all his acts of will. Because in a way unspeakably strange and wonderful, even what is done in opposition to his will is not done without his will. For it would not be done did he not permit it, and of course his permission is not unwilling but willing. Amen. What is Augustine saying here? He is not merely saying that God permits man to disobey his will but then seeks to bring good out of this. Clement of Alexandria could well say something of this kind 
as we have already seen, but such an idea would hardly fit in Augustine's theology. What he is saying is that God's will for sinners is accomplished in their disobedience of his will. It is perhaps in anticipation of our complete puzzlement at this that Augustine calls it strange and wonderful. But is it really a restoration of Pauline doctrine or is there some connection rather with the rigid determinism which has always fascinated Augustine? Now you have to understand one thing about Augustine's background. And I've, been, I've never seen this develop very much. Gordon mentions it briefly. But Augustine studied under Manet. He spent most of the rest of his Christian life fighting Manet and arguing against him and telling him he was out to lunch. But for 15 years, Augustine studied Manet's philosophy. He was a disciple of his. And Manet's philosophy was a mixture of Zen and Zoroastrianism and another Eastern concept. And the East has always had three basic things. First thing the East believes is that matter is part of illusion and is therefore evil. The second thing that the East believes is that there is no history. The eternal now finds its ultimate expression in Eastern thought. And the third thing that the East believes is that morals and personality are inheritable. That's where reincarnation comes out of. In other words, you can actually transfer morals and personality from body to body. That the personality you have now is actually the blend of millions of personalities who have inhabited other bodies in previous lives. There are three basic Eastern ideas. You tell me if Augustine was not influenced by those thought forms when he wrote his theology. Now these are premises. They are basic underlying thought forms in the East. And I have a funny feeling that in writing a Christian theology, Augustine carried into his theology those three ideas. Right at the back of his head, probably not consciously and certainly not deliberately. But that's the way it comes out. And you remember the result of all of this? When I was just a little girl, I asked my mother, what shall I be? Will I be happy? Will I be rich? As what she said to me. Forget it, kid. Say, Zerah, Zerah, whatever will be, will be. You could do it as a country and west to sing, Born to Lose. Do it as a hell's angel. Born to be wild. But what you get is that what is, is right. And isn't that what he's just saying? What is is not only right, it is what is ought to be and what is supposed to be and what God purposed it to be. And I have a funny feeling that Augustine's preaching is not going to change an Eastern country. And this country is Eastern, Eastern. Not only because there are thousands of Eastern missionaries coming in here and spreading thought forms through the counterculture, but because even the behaviorists have same, some similar ideas and thought forms. Whatever is, is right. There is no such thing as a right external to what is. But in the Bible, what is, is not right. It must be changed. That's why revival is necessary. It's why salvation is necessary. It's why God calls men to preach the gospel. Now, having looked at that, 
one couple more key things and then we are prepared to make a statement on sin. Augustine quotes very loosely from the scriptures. He's a rotten exegetist. He does not exegete. He pulls verses out of context. He does that. That was just characteristic of not only on this issue and all issues. He loved the scriptures, but he used them very, very loosely. He proof texts a lot out of context and stuff like that. And his attitude towards careful exegesis was very, very, you know, no, no, well, that's okay, this verse, let me find another verse, see. And this is in marked contrast to dudes like Oregon, who were very, very painstaking in the original language, or Justin Martyr, who stood closest to the New Testament Greek, being from that whole culture and background, and also did a great deal of research in Hebrew. And then Jerome, for his small problems, did a vast amount of scholarship. Jerome was a genius. But Augustine was the one who finally put it into a theological form and sold it to the Christian church. Now, how come that Augustine's the theology triumphed in the West? How came it become the dom dominant theology of the West? How come that Augustine's theology as dominated Christian thought form? What was it in his ideas that made them so acceptable to the Catholicism of his day and of its succeeding generations? Here is one factor that just may throw some light. Constantine now enters the picture. He was supposedly saved, and he sure ruled, in 312 AD. From Constantine's time on, persecution began not only against the pagans, but also of non-Catholic Christians. Constantine said, you define for us Christianity and we'll make it the official religion of the Roman Empire. Wherever Latin is spoken and taught, we will teach this as the official religion was the most damnable thing that ever happened to the church to make Christianity the official religion. The idea came, and Gordon will probably bring this out to some extent, that it was possible to give mental asset to a set of doctrines without having your life changed and be a Christian. That practice and theory were not necessarily the same thing. If you said, yes, I believe this statement of faith, you were saved. You did not have to live like that statement of faith stated, as long as you believed it. There were temporary lulls over these years, but it began to increase. If you were pagan, you were against the official religion. And if you were non-Catholic, also you were against the state church. And when... A slide in persecution was not, of course, without some protest from leading Catholics. Hillary of Poitiers pr protested really heavily against it when in 1385 Priscillian and his followers were executed on the orders of a synod, leading Catholics like Ambrose, remember who Ambrose was? Augustine's were horrified and totally dissociated themselves from these dudes. In other words, some of the men were going out in the church and executing people who would not get saved. And, he, and Augustine's father in the Lord, not dude who led him to the Lord, but who baptized him, was horrified. He said, ah, oh, that's awful. But when Augustine came into the scene and became a major force, there was conflicting opinion over the use of persecution, though no leading church figure seems to have approved of it or defended it, there was the use of persecution in order to get people to change. In the year 396, Augustine wrote, 
I would have no man brought into the Catholic communion against his will. Yet later on, when Augustine changed his ideas about grace, he changed his ideas about persecution. As he came to believe that God affects conversion by force on men's wills, irresistible force, and that God uses force himself in changing the wills from evil to good, so also Augustine came to believe that it was right for God's servants to use force to change people's wills. And by 408 AD, now the first statement, 396, I would have no man brought into the Catholic communion against his will. 396, where does that put him in terms of his age? Got those uh, things there? When he became Bishop of Hippo, when he is first elected as Bishop, he makes that statement. Now it is 408 AD. And he writes this to a nonconformist who advocated freedom of conscience. You are of the opinion that no one should be compelled to follow righteousness, yet you read that the householder said to his servants, whomsoever you shall find, compel them to come in. You also read how he who was at first Saul, afterwards Paul, was compelled by the great violence which with Christ coerced him to know and embrace the truth. But you cannot but think that the light which your eyes enjoy is more precious to men than money or other possessions. This light, lost suddenly by him when he was cast to the ground by the heavenly voice, he did not recover until he became a member of the Holy Church. You are also of opinion that no coercion is to be used with any man in order to his deliverance from the fatal consequences of error. And yet you see that in examples which cannot be disputed, this is done by God, who loves us with more real regard for our prophet than any other can. And you hear Christ saying, No man can come to me except the Father draw him. Now notice what he's using. He's changing the word from influence to force. Augustine here makes very clear the connection between two major changes in his thinking between 395 and 408 AD. He often repeats this argument that in persecuting nonconformists, the Catholics are but following the example of their Lord. And it is based, of course, on his new ideas about God's sovereign will. Having once come to this conclusion, Augustine was quite resolute in his advocacy of persecution, of confiscation of possessions, and of fear of punishment or pain. To the tribune Boniface, he wrote, Is it not part of the care of the shepherd when any sheep have found, have left the flock, to bring them back to the fold of his master when he has found them, by the fear or even the pain of the whip if they show symptoms of resistance? Now, there was a group that Augustine really fought against. They were called the Donatists. The Donatist Party. They were genuine Christians, but they were not Catholic. And Augustine began to institute a systematic persecution of the Donatists. He took their churches and burned them down. He arrested them and threw them in prison and stripped them of everything they had and sold all their possessions unless they joined the church. And many destitute and persecuted Donatists, understandably desperate, committed suicide by setting light to themselves. A Donatist minister named Gordentius, under persecution and threat of death, said he would sooner burn down his church with himself and his flock in it than become Catholic. Threatened again with death, he said he did not seek martyrdom but was prepared for it. Only the hireling flees when he sees the wolf coming, Gordini said. Augustine wrote, explaining the suicide impulse must be from the devil. Then he said, if you, this is Augustine, if you suppose that we ought to be moved because so many thousands die in this way, how much more consolation do you think we ought to have because far and incomparably more thousands are freed from the great madness of the Donatist party? It is true that it was the practical success of fear and pain rather than any theological or biblical argument which first led him to support persecution. But whatever caused the actual change in his view, without his new theological system, it would have been very hard to justify. 
In the mature Augustine, therefore, the state church found not only the first Christian leader of importance to advocate the use of per persecution against nonconformists, but they found the only Christian theologian of significance whose theological system would justify such persecution. It is therefore not really surprising that his new ideas made rapid advance within the state church. That by 1424 they dominated the Latin sector of it and that by 1431 they were adopted for Western Christendom at the Third Ephesian Council. 1431, 431 rather. Verduin and others have shown how the arguments Augustine used to support persecution have been repeated throughout history by many of those who adopted other features of a system. They were used by the early Catholic Church, by Luther. Remember Luther saying, wish every Jew was killed, put to death? Horrible things were said by men who were otherwise great men of God. By the Reformers, by Calvin and his associates at Geneva, by the latter Catholics to defend persecution of groups like the Huguenots. Farrar rightly comments, Augustine must bear the fatal charge of being the first as well as the ablest defenders of the frightful cause of persecution and intolerance. He was the first to misuse the words, compel them to come in of the parable, a fragmentary phrase wholly unsuited to bear the weight of horror for which it was made responsible. He was the first and ablest asserter of the principle which led to the Albigensian Crusades, the Spanish Amadas, the Netherlands butcheries, the St. Bartholomew massacres, the accursed infamies of the Inquisition, the vile espionage, the hideous bale fires of Seville and Smithfield, the racks, the gibbets, the thumbscrews, the subterranean torture chambers used by churchly torturers who assumed the garb and language of priests with the trade and temper of executioners to sicken, crush and horrify the revolted conscience of mankind. It is mainly because of his later intolerance that the influence of Augustine falls like a dark shadow across the century. It is thus that an Arnold of Citeaux, a Torquemada, a Springer, an Alva, a Philip II, a Bloody Mary Tudor, a Charles IX and a Louis XIV can look up to him as the authorizer of their enormities and quote his sentences to defend some of the vilest crimes which have ever caused men to look with horror on the religion of Christ and the Church of God. The main point is that Augustine, like the pagans, were not suggesting they should be tried for specific crimes, these people, nor even for some vague charge such as incitement to sedition, he was advocating their persecution simply because they were not Catholic. Like Christians in the pagan era, they were persecuted for religious nonconformity, not tried for specific civil offences. And the scary thing is this, the guys who did this study said this, through the influence and advocacy of Augustine, thousands of simple brethren of Christ were actually caused to be hungry, exiled, strangers, homeless, in prison, or a pain. We may indeed remember Jesus' words, Depart from me, you curse it. I was hungered, you gave me no meat. I was thirsty, you gave me no drink. I was a stranger, you took me not in. Naked, you clothed me not. Sick and in prison, you visited me not. And as much as you did it not, to one of these least you did it not unto me. How may we then reconcile the words of Jesus with Renwick's description of Augustine as the greatest Christian of his age? How may we even understand Sota's description of him as the greatest Christian since New Testament times? Even one of our leading evangelists, a man very widely used of God, seems to be affected by the common exaltation of Augustine. He recently wrote, Augustine was one of the greatest theologians of all time. He became one of the great saints of all time. On what are we to base our standards of greatness? And here's a scary thing. Augustine's great contemporary, Chrysostom, said Christians are not to destroy error by force and violence, but should work the salvation of men by persuasion, instruction and love. In short, Augustine's whole background had been one of tolerance and he himself was a champion of tolerance early in his Christian life. He abandoned this earlier tolerance to become himself the first great Christian thinker to advocate violence, fear and pain to spread the gospel. John Calvin had Servetus, Michael Servetus, burnt at the stake. What people do not usually know is they had him burnt over green wood, so it took him three hours to be pronounced dead. 
When this happened, a cry of outrage resounded over most of Europe. A pamphlet was written asking if Christ had now become Moloch to demand human sacrifice or if we could picture Christ as one of the constables lighting the fire. To this Calvin's close associate, Beza could only reply, of all the blasphemous and impudent gabs, an appeal to the times, that the times molded what Augustine did or what Calvin did is not convincing. It becomes the less convincing we are told often by the same apologists that those like Calvin and Augustine were the most competent Bible scholars in history. Surely if Calvin could write a work hailed as the most systematic treatise on the Christian faith ever written, it is an insult to suggest his moral teaching was not an integral part of his system, but was based on some opinions of contemporary men. If Augustine had the greatness of mind and strength of character to overturn all the Christian teaching of the first 300 years, it is absurd to excuse his advocacy of persecution on the grounds of a spirit in him of conformity. Tragic fact is surely that those who deny any power but God's and hence reduce everyone, including Satan, to servants of God may, if times are ripe, finish by using Satan's own weapons of fear and force, pain and persecution. We must decide for ourselves whether we believe that Augustine or the Christians of the first three centuries had the true Pauline doctrine. Our decision in this issue is going to affect our whole attitude to God and his conflict with evil. Is the conflict a real one? Are we really wrestling in Christ against powers of evil? If we are using the weapons of Christ, then what methods does he use for warfare and touching men's souls? These are not merely academic questions, but will have a practical effect on the methods we adopt and on the urgency with which we obey Paul's command to fight the good fight. Very, very key historical study. Now, you tell me this, when we get up to preach about what the Church of Jesus Christ has done, what is the major historical slap in the face that Christians get? The Crusades, the Inquisition, the Amadas. Isn't that what we are accused of being? You say that Christianity is a peaceful blah, blah. What about this? What about that? What about that? That's why I'm saying, when you take a position that is not Augustine's, you are flying right against what the world thinks Christianity is. And it's not prepared to handle that at all. It really isn't. So you can see what we're talking about, Reformation. This is a real Reformation. It's going back earlier than Augustine, earlier than the Reformers. It's going back to something different than what Augustine has said and the church is just simply built on in the Western church, not being true of the other two branches of the church, but in the Western church for the last 1,500 years. Okay, let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you for history. We thank you, first of all, that the Bible is a history book. The records there of real people who lived and dying to put forward truth and put it in our hands today. We thank you, O oh God, that there has been more history written since. We thank you for the invention of printing, for these records that survive to this day, the things that men said in their time. We praise you that by the ability to study history we can get a, a better overall picture of what has happened before so that we can see that issues which are often thought of as new issues are not really new at all but have been battled over for centuries. We thank you for the perspective that history offers. And we ask, O oh God, that you'll make us fit representatives for the gospel of Jesus Christ. We want to be like you. We want to have the power that comes from loving obedience to the word of God. We pray that you'll keep us from becoming like the people that we are trying to minister to by giving us a correct picture of you and your ways and the way you fight your battles. For Jesus.